Hi, welcome to this video where I'm going to talk about systems thinking and in particular I'm going to focus on applied systems thinking or systems thinking in practice. So this would be relevant to managers or analysts or policy makers. So the thing that really triggered my interest in systems um, when I did a master's back at Lancaster with Peter Checkland was this idea that um, in reality uh, there is only one world so everything that we think about and, and in relation to science relates to, to that one world. And so therefore, really, there is one science. Uh, and although science has become separated, in reality, um, they, they need to come back together. And that was one of the driving forces behind systems thinking. Now, when we think about science, uh, we understand that, that, that science tries to understand the world, to describe the world, to explain the world. And traditionally, science has operated through reductionism. That's where objects are studied in isolation, uh, objects are taken apart to see how they work, and, and we try and explain the world from the bottom up. So, so we start with atoms, and then we go to uh, molecules and cells. But biology has said, hang on a minute, um, there's a problem with reductionism, because in order to study biological phenomena, uh, we need to study the object as a whole, uh, because systemic properties only uh, are only apparent at the level of the system. And if we take biological objects to pieces, then the systemic properties actually disappear and we can't see them anymore. So, for example, you know, if, if we were to try and understand a dog, obviously we could understand a dog in terms of, of its parts and we could take the dog to pieces. Uh, but if, if we're interested in systemic properties like behaviour of dogs, then we need to study the animal and the, the owner as a whole, as a system. Otherwise, we won't be able to understand those properties. Now, the word system has been incredibly uh, um uh, effective and it has been used in all sorts of uh, um, <coughs> areas. So if we think of uh, some examples here, so if we look at um, terms like the solar system, the central nervous system, the heating system, the decimal system, the education system, the ecological system, uh, they all use the term system but they're all quite different in terms of what the actual reference are. So for example, the solar system is, is the sun and planets, which is actually a physical system, whereas the central nervous system is actually a network of nerve cells. It's a biological system, which is actually a very different type of system. The heating system, uh, boiler and radiators, is actually a, what we call a designed physical system because it's been created by, by human beings. The decimal system is a number classification system, but notice that that's actually abstract. It has no physical reality, but it's still referred to as a system. The education system is very different. Um, teachers, schools, um, things like that. That's a human system, a social system, if you like. Um, ecological system, that's a natural system in, in, in involving earth, plants, animals, etc. So notice all of these are very, very different in terms of the actual reference, the things that we're referring to. But they're all core systems because they're all assemblies, assemblies of things that are interconnected together to create a whole in some sense. Now, uh, as managers, as analysts, uh, we tend to be much more focused on um, organisations and society viewed as systems because that, that's where we operate. So theorists began to view society and organisations as systems um, within social science and also in sociology. But applied systems researchers like uh, Russ Acoff uh, in the USA, Stafford Beer, Peter Checkland in the UK began to ask what does this mean for policy making and for management? and for analysis. And various methods and tools have been developed to aid policy makers, managers and analysts. Uh, basically over the 70s and 80s that those approaches uh, uh, developed. Now we haven't got time in this video to really get into systems th uh, theory because it's very complicated but if we use a general system concept, uh, here it is. So a system, we tend to think of a system as containing subsystems which are connected together and have relationships. Uh, and the system is part of a wider system, a, a larger system. Uh, and the system is also uh, within an environment which, which affects the system. And uh, the system has systemic properties, uh, things like, for example, being able to adapt, survive, uh, those sorts of things. Now, 
Uh, in applied systems thinking, we tend to use the concept as a way of conceptualizing reference like organizations, business units, services, processes, even change projects. Uh, and we might view uh, those reference descriptively, saying, what type of a system is this? Uh, or we might think of it uh, creatively. So we might say, well, how could this uh, organization or business unit be in the future? So more of a design thinking mode. And we also tend to view organizations as being part of wider systems uh, like society or, or perhaps a corporation. Uh, and we always think of systems as, as existing in an environment. Now, in terms of the tools that you'll find or the methods, uh, I've split them up here. So uh, we, uh, what you'll find is, is tools for modeling and simulating systems. Um, so, for example, here's an example from um, uh, Dr. Rue in, in the Netherlands, where what they try to do is, is try and model uh, the prison service as a system using uh, influence diagrams and this was done with a group of people. Uh, here was a, a piece of research done by Professor David Lane um, from Reading and, and basically what they were trying to do is, is build a model of, of the child protection system in the UK to understand how that um, service could be improved and developed. Now because people have been doing this uh, for many, many years, it started at MIT uh, in the USA uh, with Jay Forrester. They've noticed that certain types of system archetypes seem to crop up. Um, and uh, if, if you look at the work of Peter Senge, he, he made that famous with a book called The Fifth Discipline. Now, another way that we use systems thinking in practice is to uh, design organizational systems with, with methods like the viable system model and with systems engineering. Um, now I haven't got time to go into systems engineering, but um, we'll have a quick look at the viable system model developed by Stafford Beer. Beer was really interested in knowing whether there are generic features which all successful systems need to have in order to be successful. Um, and his for him, the notion of success was viability. So, i.e., a, a, a system is successful if it's able to adapt and survive over time. And he identified uh, five uh, main systems within uh, a system which would help it to, to survive over time. And those are basically system uh, three, four, and five, which are essentially management elements. So, policy, i.e., understanding you know, which direction to go and, and, and create strategy. System four, which is about understanding what's happening in the environment, uh, which is E in this diagram. And then system three is about controlling the organization internally. So we need those three aspects to be successful. And then within the organization, O in this diagram, uh, we need a system two, which is about um, maintaining stability and coordination and then the actual subsystems within the organization. And what's really interesting about the viable system model is that the subsystems within the organization are also seen as viable systems. So you can see um, that the actual way they're represented on that diagram, the actual subsystems 1A, 1B, 1C are all actually viable systems as well. So this introduces this notion of autonomy within the system as a way of managing um, the complexity that the organization faces. So that's viable system, very, very quickly. I'll do another uh, video on this uh, uh, where, where I'll go into the VSM in more depth. Now, another way that systems ideas have been used is in soft operational research. And, and this is where we use systems ideas to help us think and learn about how to improve complex situations. Um, so this emerged in the 70s and 80s, Akoff, Churchman, Mitroff, Mason in the USA, Checklin Eden, Friend, Rosenhead, Mingers in the UK, uh, and a classic book, Rational Analysis for the Problematic World, came out in 1989. And it was really uh, about uh, trying to understand how, how analytic tools could be used to help managers when, when situations were very complex and, and difficult to understand. So uh, this notion of problem structuring methods uh, uh, was created and, and basically PSMs were um, 
were seen for use with unstructured problems, complex situations, strategic thinking. Uh, and it was really when you want to use a group of participants to be involved in the decision making and facilitation is needed. And the tools are really conceptual tools. And there's a couple of nice uh, quotes here. Unstructured problems were seen to involve multiple stakeholders, multiple perspectives, conflicting interests, various types of uncertainties and significant intangibles. And PSMs offer a way of representing the situation that will enable participants, participants to clarify their predicaments, converge on a potentially actionable mutual problem or issue within it and agree on commitments that will at least partially resolve it. Uh, <clears throat> Now, the key changes here to, to approaches like systems engineering, when we get to these softer approaches, is that the overall purpose of the approach is experiential learning rather than system design. Uh, so we can see we're being much more humble here. Um, we start with a holistic view of the situation, including stakeholder views, culture and politics. So we're trying to be more holistic. We're trying to understand and appreciate more the systemic properties. Um, and a process consulting philosophy is adopted um, with facilitation and stakeholder participation. So this is not a case of experts deciding what the solution is. This is about getting everybody together. And systems modeling is used more flexibly to explore ideas, designs, theories, points of view. So, uh, you know, when, when you're dealing with this type of strategic complex problems, you know, we can't assume that we understand the situation completely and we don't know if our solutions are going to work um, properly. So we need to take much more of an experiential uh, learning type approach with these with these approaches. Now, if we want to think of that in terms of logic, we start with a complex situation. We have a group of people with different points of view. We try and map that complex situation, including those different points of view. And then we do some modeling, which, which adds some formality to this. And then that leads to discussion in terms of improvements and action plans for the future. And this is a cycle which in, prin in principle is ongoing. It's an experiential learning cycle. Now, uh, these sorts of soft OR tools can be used in lots of different ways. The classic way is a practitioner facilitating a group of people within a workshop environment. But I personally uh, like to use it for strategic coaching. So that's where I work one on one with the decision maker in a confidential environment to explore ideas and, and strategies. Uh, we've also used it for applied research. So that's when we're doing research which is working with qualitative data and we need tools to help us structure uh, that that qualitative data and, and soft OR methods are really good at that. Um, also for stakeholder engagement, so certainly for large scale public sector projects they are that there's often a need to, to, to get stakeholder engagement and these tools are great for that as well. So just a few examples of, of some tools here. Here's, here's a rich picture which is a way of representing a situation as a whole. Here we've got a group of senior managers um, uh, drawing a picture, um, and there's the picture that they actually drew. That took about an hour, um, an hour and a half, and, and that's a representation of their strategic situation as a whole. Here's uh, some more managers. This is the National Public Health Service of Wales. Here they're actually trying to picture the future of that of that uh, organisation by, by looking forward and trying to create a vision of what that service might be in the future. Now, in terms of thinking of things as systems, here's an example of a cinema, a simple, very simple system, really. You know, we could view it as a system to show blockbuster movies in order to achieve high volume and obtain maximum profits. Or we could view it as a system to show artistic movies in order to present people with creative new ideas and support the culture of a local population. Both of those views of a, of a cinema are legitimate and obviously it depends on the organisation which view they want to take. But thinking of it as a system is a way of getting everybody to be able to communicate about exactly what we're talking about. Now here's an example of a real definition and model from a project that we did for the Trussell Trust. Uh, I haven't got time to go through that now, but this just gives you a sort of sense of, of, of a real project output. Uh, here's a, a project that we did for, for Network Rail, where we've got a group of engineers trying to build models of um, systems and share that with other people uh, in the workshop. Now, um, this type of systems thinking, you know, which is about de describing systems or 
designing systems um, can be is, is very very flexible um, uh, if you want to see more of that I, I've written a paper in 2011 but you know we can be modeling systems within the situation uh, so describing systems in baseline models or designing new systems with, with design models we can also explore theoretical views of systems within a situation but we can also use this modeling language to actually plan changes to situations so we can actually look for desirable transformations in a situation or we can actually model the actual change project itself uh, so there's some further reading there if you want to follow that up. Um, there's also been a, a, a trend more recently where people have taken more of a critical uh, look at systems thinking and explored things like multi-methodology. This emerged through the 80s and 90s. Um, uh, contributors like Mingers, Jackson, Floyd, Ulrich, Midgley, Keyes, White have explored this. I don't have time to go into that now, but I thought I would mention it. They start to raise issues about boundary judgments. So, for example, system th system thinking, the effort to consider the whole system, cannot alter the fact that our claim remains partial in the double sense that being selective about relevant facts and norms, benefiting some parties more than others. And that's because how we draw the line between the system and the environment is always a matter of judgment in practice. So boundary judgments distinguish the system of concern from its physical and social environment. That is, they define the borders of concern. So if you say to somebody, I'm sorry, but you're in the environment, then you're making that person outside of, of, of your, your boundary or your system of concern. They also uh, raised issues about uh, the relationship between par participants and how that can be different in different organisations. So uh, is it a unitary situation where participants uh, share similar values, beliefs and interests? share common purpose and are all involved in decision making or is it more of a pluralist situation where situations where participants share compatible interests but values and beliefs differ and spaces needed to debate for debate disagreement and conflict to occur but accommodations and compromises can be found if all feel involved in the decision making productive action is therefore possible or is it a more coercive situation so few interests in common with conflicting values and beliefs, compromise not possible, so no agreed objectives, decisions taken on the basis of power and coer coercion employed to ensure obedience. So the, these academics were trying to sort of flag up that um, not all organisations are the same, not all organisational situations are the same, and, and these sort of more sociological concerns will affect this type of systems thinking practice. Now, if you want to look for more uh, information on problem structuring methods, you can look at a classic text, Rosenhead and Mingers, Rational Analysis for a Polymetric World. Uh, if you want to look uh, for more detail of systems thinking in terms of uh, practical systems thinking, I, I would recommend uh, Mike Jackson's Systems Thinking, Creative Whole Holism for Managers. Um, um, so I hope you found that useful. Um, I'll, I'll be looking at all of these different topics in more detail in other videos. Okay, thanks a lot.